right after the service, we're having a Discover VBC class. I want to encourage all of you who are newer to our church or not yet members to go check out that class. Uh, you don't have to commit to join in the church, but you will learn more about us. And you may wonder, where is membership commanded in the Bible? Well, let's just say that membership enables you to keep the New Testament commands. It helps us with accountability and encouragement. So go ahead and be impulsive today. Go down the hall off to your left and join us for our Discover VBC class. As I often say each week, I'm called to preach the word, no matter how difficult it is. But I really think today is probably one of the most difficult uh, doctrines and subjects to process. But I figured since last week on Easter, we talked about hell and propitiation. You are ready for it. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, when we are undergoing a variety of trials and problems and sufferings, it's hard to accept your word that speaks into our lives, a word that sometimes you receive is difficult. And I could imagine the Hebrews, all the trials they were undergoing, and yet this wasn't supposed to be necessarily a hard word for them, but your word says it's a word of encouragement. So I pray for my brothers and sisters today that we'll be patient, we would listen to your word, and if it goes against even some of what we've assumed for so long, that you would change our hearts and our minds to bring it more in line with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. The Christian life is hard. The Christian life is full of trials and difficulties. It could be personal. We're going to be having some relational issues, perhaps even in your marriage or with your friends. It also can be difficult physically and maybe emotionally. Maybe your body's falling apart or you have some sickness or some mental illness. Just in general, there can be difficulties in your life from hard circumstances to death of loved ones, a loss of job, a future hopes dash. The question is, when difficulties happen to us, how should we view God? I'm going to give you a couple of options. Some of us view God as more like an ER doctor. And some of us can view God more like a surgeon. Think about it. You go out into the world and you have a lot of difficulties that happen to you. You get cut. You have hardship. You lose your job. Difficulty, sickness. And you rush into the ER and God is the ER doctor. All the stuff has happened to you. You come and say, God, make something good come out of this, please. He's an ER doctor. Or... God's a surgeon. He knows exactly where to cut. He brings or allows or ordains specific hardships to come into your life to heal you and draw you closer to him. So what is it? I mean, you have hardships. All of us have hardships. Are we rushing to the ER and say, God, fix us, make something good? Or are we to see what is happening to us as God carefully, as a surgeon, cutting to draw us closer to him? This is kind of the idea that I want to, to explore today as we look at the book of Hebrews. Now, now get this. We're not going to have all your questions answered this morning, this, this summer, we're going to be going through the book of Job, and we're going to be talking about suffering and God's sovereignty all the time. But let's kind of jump delicately into that subject this morning, and I guarantee you some of you are going to hear some things you've never heard before. Be patient. Look at the word. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And when we were last in Hebrews two weeks ago, we saw Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. And we learned that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, who has run the race before us with absolute faithfulness. And we're to consider all the pain and suffering he endured 
from sinful man all the way to the cross. And the point of looking at Jesus is so that we will press on in our faith and not give up when we face pain and suffering. Okay, you ready for this? Let's go patiently. I'm going to try to go slower today. All right, let's start with verse 4 of chapter 12. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. I want you to think about this idea that it's not a struggle against personal sin, but it's a struggle more of sinners against them. In verses 1 through 3, we have this athletic imagery of running. But now we have this imagery of fighting. And don't think of fighting boxing. Think it more like ultimate fighting where you're trying to tear one another to shreds and rip each other's heads off. That kind of fighting. And here the Hebrews have been in a struggle against sinners in this world. And how have the Hebrews uh, suffered? Well, they have had pers- they've been persecuted for their faith. Some of them have had their property taken away by evil men. Some of them have been thrown into prison. So they've been having this struggle against sinners. And yet he's saying, you've not yet suffered to the point of shedding your blood like Jesus did at the cross. Yet. Not yet. Perhaps it will come, but not yet. Verses 5 and 6. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Wait, stop. Don't read any further. Get this. We're about to quote Proverbs 3. And we are told that this is a word of encouragement. Think about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know what I'm saying? You're like, that's the best verses ever. Proverbs 3, word of encouragement. Well, I'm wondering if you'll view also a quote from Proverbs 3 as a word of encouragement. Let's turn there again. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Perhaps that's not been one of your memory verses. And yet, that is a word of encouragement that the Hebrews and us seem to have forgotten. In the midst of people taking their property, persecuting them, throwing them into jail, they have forgotten this word of encouragement that says that God rebukes, disciplines, punishes, which is the idea of whips or scourges those he loves and accepts. Yes, evil men are responsible for what's been happening to them, but we are told that somehow, mysteriously, in the midst of that, God is the one disciplining them, chastising them. It's not random events, but God is somehow sovereign in control of this discipline through all the pain. Now, I don't want to see any show of hands, but I'm pretty sure this is new to a lot of you. Because maybe this is the way you have grown up thinking. There's God, and then there's Satan, and they're equal, bad against good. And Satan and his minions are loose in this world, causing all type of havoc. And God, he has no control over any of that. They mess us up. We run to him. He works somehow some good through it all. And yet, we are told right here in the midst of all evil people doing evil to them that somehow God is behind it for discipline. What in the world is going on? Verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. It is for discipline that you endure. Another translation would say, endure hardship as discipline. Now, I believe that this would include all types of hardship and suffering and pain that happens in our lives, that God, in his loving sovereignty, disciplines us and brings hard things our ways. Now, this could include things such as 
earthquakes, hurricanes, and even destructions of cities. You're like, well, how is God behind all that? This is a fallen humanity, fallen world, absolutely. But we are told in Amos 3.6, when disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Well, that's interesting. He's not responsible for it, but has he not caused it? Okay. Exodus 4.11, the Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? This could even include opposition from sinful men. You can think about Joseph being persecuted by his evil brothers and it said they intended for evil and yet God intended for good, the saving of a nation. We could go into all that later on. I think what I'm getting at is that one of my favorite verses, if not my favorite verse in the whole Bible, is Ephesians 1.11. It says, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. Everything. When people do evil, they are 100% responsible for their sin. God is never the author of evil. He is never morally responsible for it. And yet what we are saying is that God is still sovereign. He's still in control. He's not stepped away. So I don't know how you want to phrase this in your mind. You may say, okay, God causes things. God ordains things. God allows suffering. However you want to say that, God ordains suffering. He allows suffering. He causes suffering. Though he's not morally responsible for it. However you want to phrase it, can't we all agree? Hopefully we can all agree with this. That God has the power to stop suffering from coming your way, but at times he chooses not to. Can we all agree with that? He has power to stop it and he chooses not to. And so if that's the case, how are we supposed to process when suffering comes our way? Do we rush to the ER doctor? God thickens us up or do we come to God and we say, okay, God, I'm not sure what you're doing here, but you're doing something working in me. I don't know how you view it right now, but let's keep going, okay? Okay. Oh, by the way, I know some of you may be thinking right now, if God is the one causing suffering in my life, that makes things far worse, not better. Anybody thinking that? Yeah, that just makes it worse, not better. We'll get there, we'll get there. Verse seven again. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there who has, whose his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which of you have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. All right? Okay. During this time, it was understood, crazy idea, I know, that, that fathers would discipline their kids. Crazy idea, I know. But it's biblically understood that parents, in particular fathers, will discipline their kids, and that includes spanking um, Proverbs 13, 24, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline. So if I don't spank my kids, I don't love them. And if I love them, I'll discipline them. And God treats his children the same way. But notice again in verse 8, that if there is no discipline, perhaps they are illegitimate children and not true sons. You see, a man in the Roman society could have many kids by a mistress or a concubine, which would make them illegitimate children. These kids would not carry the family name, nor was the father responsible for them at all. He didn't show interest in educating them, training them, or disciplining them because he reserved those rights for only his own children. In the same way, we would say that God only disciplines those who are his children by faith in Jesus. So if you are undergoing the discipline of God, 
right now through a variety of hardships, you need to be encouraged that it is a sign of love, not opposition. Because he is your father. And if you are his true child, you will undergo discipline. The question is, how are we to respond when our father disciplines us? Verse 9. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respect them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? The idea here is that we are to submit ourselves, be subject to our father and live. To submit to God when we're undergoing hardships means to continue to trust and obey him, to continue to follow after his word. But the opposite of following the Lord during trials and suffering is what we saw earlier in verse five where we're making light of God's discipline or we're losing heart. So the opposite of submitting to God is making light of it. And one of the ways we make light of hardships in our life is we pout or complain. Any pouters or complainers in here? Yeah. Another way we make light of his discipline is we may get angry or try to get out from under it or to run away. I mean, think about in your life the difficulties you may have here. Maybe you're having a difficulty in your marriage. You're like, I just want out of this right now. And yet you know the Lord is calling you from his word to stay in your marriage. Can you submit to him and love your spouse? The same can happen with jobs, health. A lot of ways we can try to escape, pout, complain, get angry, or we can submit to the Lord in these hardships and say, God, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to continue to trust you. What I think we should say is, Father, I have not planned this. I did not expect this, but I will submit to you and obey. Father, this is not what I planned, but I will just submit to you and obey obey. All right, let's review where we've been so far, just because I know it's been a lot here. So number one, God initiates suffering and discipline in our lives. Number two, God does this because he loves us and it proves that we're his children. And number three, we are to submit to him and the discipline. Now, if you just look at those three, you go, well, that's fine, but what's the point? What is the point of this discipline? Let's look at verses 10 and 11. For they, that's earthly fathers, for they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So fathers, you see, you discipline your kids as seem best, and sometimes fathers are not as firm as they should be, or other times they are too harsh. But it says specifically here, you might want to underline it, is that God disciplines us for our good. It's not retribution. He's not intending to harm us or condemn us, but it is intending to bring hard things our way for our good. And it may seem painful at the time. It says no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. That is the way it feels, and that's the way what you're maybe undergoing right now. But through the pain of discipline, God is working for good. Back to one of your memory verses, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So when you start to see everything, including the discipline of God, is for your good to conform you to the likeness of Christ, then hopefully be more eager to submit to it. But you ever wonder, why is God doing this? Why is God allowing this? What have I done? What is the point? Well, here's the point. Once again, underline it, verse 10. The point is so that we may share in his holiness. God is disciplining you, allowing hardships to come your way to share in your holiness. Have you ever heard this before? God doesn't want your happiness. God wants your holiness. He's not here to make you happy. He's here to make you holy. And I, I, don't, I don't like those two being separated because I believe that as God produces more and more holiness in your life, 
your joy and happiness will increase in him, the ultimate source of joy and happiness. So just don't, don't separate the two, that God wants your happiness and your holiness in him. And what he does, he brings hardships our way to wake us up, to produce this harvest of righteousness. You ever just walking along, you're like, you're, you're getting distracted. You know that? You get distracted and somehow hardship comes your way, affliction comes your way, and it drives you to the Lord. We know that that's biblical. Like Psalm 119.67 says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Maybe cruising along in life, kind of nonchalant in your relationship with the Lord, not paying attention to the things of the Lord. And then someone close to you gets cancer or is in an accident or someone criticizes you or hurts you. And the pain is great and it hurts bad, but there's something in you that wakes up to the reality of the Lord. And you may say, well, come on. Well, can't we just grow other ways? Aren't there just other ways to grow besides pain and suffering? Well, I'm glad you asked. And the answer is yes. You can read the word. You can be in fellowship. You can memorize the word. You can encourage each other. You can share your faith. You can obey. There's a lot of ways that we can grow in the Lord. But there's something that God does in causing us to struggle and strive against sinful people against this that awakes us up. Perhaps you've heard this quote from A.W. Tozer. It is doubtful if God can bless a man greatly without hurting him deeply. Now don't think of that as him being mean, but of him waking us up. Some of the most holiest people I know have been through great tragedies and trials. And I know some of you are trusting the Lord in the midst of that pain. And we are also told that it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. Some of you have been through so much trials, and yet there is this peace that is settled on you. You're believing in God's goodness. You're believing in God's sovereignty. You're believing in God's control. You're not filled with anxiety. You're not filled with worry. You're not filled with fear. There's something about this peace that is settled in on you through your trials and suffering. Finish up with verses 12 and 13. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. And this passage ends up with more athletic imagery taken from Isaiah and Proverbs. And the Hebrews are probably weak and they had their hands and arms down by their sides and their knees were faltering. They weren't running strong and they were tired and discouraged. It just reminds me of one of my kids and my days when I have younger kids and uh, I have a hard day at work and my kids are saying, hey, dad, come look at this, come see this. And I just slump my shoulders and I just walk toward them. What do you want? What do you want? And that's the imagery here. It's like, no, no, get up. God's got a plan. He's, he's working for your good. He's, yes, challenges are coming your way, but it, it's, it's just like it's awakening you. Just understand you are not running to the ER doctor God to somehow fix up everything that is messed up. But somehow understand that God is sovereign. He's in control. He's allowing things to come my way. He is the surgeon that is cutting me to grow me, to make me holy, to give me a settled peace. Now, my brothers and sisters, this teaching is hard to understand. This teaching is hard to accept. But do you notice chapter 12 comes after chapter 11, and chapter 11 is all about faith. So there's something in you that has to believe that God as a surgeon is cutting just right for you, for your joy, for your holiness in him. Because if we didn't have faith, it would look like this. We don't see God, but we see back pain. We don't see God, but we see pain people ignoring us when we share the gospel. We don't see God, but we see prodigal children. 
We don't see God, but we see people breaking our hearts. We don't see God, but we see cancer. We don't see God, but we see difficult people. We don't see God, but we see black clouds. That's why we must bring faith, even in the midst of our suffering and trials, to understand that he is a loving, heavenly father who is doing just the right cuts to draw us to him. And you may think, man, this is, this is really hard teaching because on one hand, you've got evil people doing things to us. And you're saying that God is somehow sovereign and in control? Think about the most evil that was ever done in history. Putting Jesus Christ on the cross at the hands of evil people. Who was responsible? Romans, the Jews, you, me, our sin. But the Bible says behind it all was a sovereign, decreed plan of God for our salvation and our redemption. So yes, me, you, Romans, Jews, all morally responsible for what was done to Jesus, but God in his sovereignty was working something good. And in your life right now, it may feel like the clouds are not parting, they're not going away, they're not lifting And I want to encourage you, don't run away, don't complain, don't pout, don't get angry, but maybe for the first time say, Lord, I don't know what's happened to me, it's painful, people have done it, my body's breaking down, whatever, but Lord, starting this morning, I'm going to submit to you, I'm going to trust you, I'm going to obey you. And I'm going to come to you to see that somehow you've been involved in all this. Even all the hardships you may have suffered in the past with maybe terrible family situations, terrible things done to you, that somehow God has been sovereign and control. He's been drawing you to himself. And even as a believer, you're facing trials not to push you away from God, but to draw you closer and closer to him, producing a harvest of righteousness and peace, and joy in him that surpasses all. And so we don't have to run to the ER and say, okay, God, fix this up, make something good of us, but we can rest in his sovereign hand of the surgeon who is working for your good and his glory. Let's pray. Lord, I do ask and I pray for the man or woman I hear this morning who has a lot of doubts about your love and care for them that you would let them know right now that you love and care for them, that you're working out a plan in their life and it's not the plan that they had, it's not what they wanted, but in your loving discipline, you're drawing them to you. And Lord, help us not to think, oh, well, because I did this, God's doing that, or because I did that, God's doing this. Lord, help us just to see that we are sinners in need of being drawn to you and following you. And so whether our property gets confiscated or we get persecuted for our faith or get thrown into jail or face a variety of other hardships and tribulations, that you are our loving surgeon here to heal us and to produce this harvest of righteousness and peace. And may we find that in you. In Jesus' name, amen.